Welcome to the shop. I'm continuing in Koala Production Run 5 on my new Haas Mini Mill 2 and discovering so many ways to make mistakes, even on the camera. I've got, uh, I'm using a, uh, a wireless microphone and the wireless microphone receiver plugs into a little eighth inch jack. And it turns out that right on the other side of the camera from the eighth inch jack is the manual focus button. So I'm grabbing the camera and squeezing the jack into place to try to make it so that it doesn't move around on the tripod and get my shot out of frame. And it, it resulted in at least one segment of yesterday's video being out of focus. Oh. So I've been continuing to learn the quirks of the mini mill and it really you know once i figure it out it really does excellent work um the last batch of two-part numbers that i made are uh, around twice the speed uh production speed of uh what i was doing on the tormach and i suspect that and not only was it twice the speed, but I was doing more operations. I didn't do the skinning operation on the top and bottom on the Tormach, so I'm doing more work and doing it faster. Um, of course, I am using a piece of custom software to manage the uh, bizarre limitation of the, the Haas tool holder, the, the uh, automated tool changer carousel, and so I wrote this custom piece of software to manage it, which introduces another step and another way to make mistakes. And while preparing for this part, sure enough, I found a bug in the software, which resulted in the machine attempting to tap with a quarter inch end mill. Well, it boogered the part, but it didn't hurt the machine, didn't ruin the end mill, but wow, there are just so many things that I need to get right learning a new machine, I mean, CNC machining in general is not easy. And this process, I'm doing many, many setups, some of them complex and non-standard, on a new machine with custom software and making a video. So, hey, might as well make it hard. Harder it is, the more fun it is. So going to load up this blank and this this guy is a bit of an oddball. I'm kind of starting with some of the oddballs just to make sure that I have a strategy for dealing with them. Um, this piece, if I just put it in one vise, it's got too much stick out and I don't like machining unsupported ends like that. So I made a little spacer that the part goes up against and then for the probing operation, used my one, two, three block and the same, almost the same probing code, instead of probing that corner, it probed over here to probe the top and the sides of the one, two, three block and then subtract the thickness of the block to set the zero on the ledge of the soft jaws. So, Let's get this part in place. And it's already been tested, so I'm just going to run it at full speed. 100% rapid. No reason to slow down or stop. Poke some holes using the recommended uh, feeds and speeds that are provided by the CAD program, uh, 508 surface feet per minute, which results in almost 10,000 RPM for that little guy. I'm glad that I got the 10,000 RPM spindle. It really makes a lot of things work better. And my new improved tool path and feeds and speeds 
are resulting in very little, if any, buildup of uh, stringy chips on the tools. I'm getting very good chip clearance. This one is also 508 surface feet per minute at 5,770, 5,170 RPM. It's hard to read the number here. It keeps jumping around. And feeding at uh, 14 inches per minute for a feed rate of one and a half thousandths feed per tooth, which is the recommended value for high-speed steel. Now I'm going to be ramping into a rough cut with the Lakeshore Carbide aluminum shredder. This is a roughing tool that makes super fine chips. Uh, and it looks like my tool path produces absolutely no chip buildup on the tool. In the past, I had a problem with that tool and that operation, and I had to kind of like try a bunch of different combinations to get it to uh, correctly execute that function without building up a rat nest of chips. And finally, rigid power tapping, the real thing. The Tormach could kind of get away with it with the compression tension tapping head, but this machine does it right. And it has the proper uh, tool holder geometry that allows the excellent flood coolant to be applied. And I don't need to do a pause to blow off the part and apply the tap magic. So. First operation just looks beautiful, I tell you. I tell you, I say, and I'll tell you again. Machine, the software may annoy me, but this machine makes beautiful parts. So, I'm going to see how much material I have. I probably won't be able to run the whole batch because I don't have enough material in stock and I'm not even sure how many I'm going to make. I usually make a batch of 10, but I've got now 16 names on the waiting list, so probably going to make a batch of 20 and I don't have enough material for 20, so I'm going to turn the camera off and make as many as I can and then come back again on the tooling plate for the outside perimeter involving high-speed machining. So, see you later. The first operation has been completed. Um, I used all the material I had in stock. I haven't quite made the entire run, and I have made a decision. I'm going to make uh, 20 sets of parts for production run number five and I only had enough material for 19, so next time I go get material, I'll finish up that last one with the new automated probing uh, setup uh, changing, or you know, once I have a working tool path, it, loading it and running it is so much faster than it was on the Tormach because I have the automated probing and don't need to uh, probe everything manually using the Heimer and the, uh, and the Jog shuttle control. So, I've, uh, I've already run apart, um, so you're not going to get to see the uh, trial and error of figuring out and debugging, and yes, everything went well. I did, uh, little bit by little bit, I'm starting to refine my idiot checking, cross checking, is so that uh, I can have the system help me not make mistakes. Um, as I said in previous videos, I always prefer an automated system, not necessarily because I'm lazy, but having to execute a long sequence of manual steps, well, there's always a chance for error. So, in my new system, I modified the post processor uh, the Bobcad post processor, so that it, uh, at every tool change, uh, has a comment that shows a uh, tool offset number, which, as you remember from previous videos, if you saw the previous videos, the tool offset number does not correspond to the tool number or position in the Haas carousel. 
and managing that uh, correspondence between the two numbers required writing a special custom post post processor program and just paying attention. So now the post processor has a comment that tells me what tool offset is com has just been loaded after a tool change and then performs an optional stop so that I can look at it and of course when the Haas does a tool change, it orients the spindle to the same position every time, which is a kind of a cool feature. And that position happens to be where I have my label on my tool holder. So when the optional stop occurs, I can look at the label on the tool holder, compare it to the setup sheet, compare it to the comment in the G code, and be somewhat confident that I'm actually uh, have the right tool in the spindle. At that point I put it into single step mode and 25 percent rapid and watch it rapid down to the uh, pre-feed position which is approximately an inch above where the action is going to be and if I see it blowing through that inch I have enough time to press the red button to keep it from causing any more problems. And then once everything is okay, turn off option stop, turn off uh, single step, and then just go ahead and run at full speed. So I've got my tooling plate in place. I've got my zero probed at the top of the tooling plate. I've got the X and Y zero probed to the length of the spacer using my one, two, three block. And then I'm gonna get my part in place here. Put on the safety glasses, which are also prescription glasses, so it helps me see what I'm doing. And kind of convenient that this part, uh, there's kind of chip in that hole, <laughs> kind of convenient that this part has four 832 tight drilled holes very near the edges, makes it very convenient for the screws in the tooling plate. going to be using a high-speed machining profile for get the option stop off going to be using a high-speed machining profile for the rough that basically turns all the waste material into chips which works really well for my chip auger in the past with the Tormach I would cut the profile out using a, a 3 8 roughing tool and this resulted in some uh, waste piece. Well first of all it resulted in a cut that was cutting a slot that potentially would have chip evacuation problems if I tried uh, more aggressively feeding the tool I might end up having problems with chips getting clogged and those little pieces that are left over the the little pointy long pieces that fall off if those get caught in the chip auger, well, I'm going to have a bad time going and trying to pull them all out. So for two reasons, to keep, the, to keep the chips under control and keep the chip auger working properly and to increase production rate, I've moved to a high-speed machining cycle using a half-inch three-flute solid carbide aluminum cutting tool, and uh, it, it seems to work really well. So here goes. High speed machining on the Haas Mini Mill 2. Ten thousand RPM, two hundred and fifty inches per minute, half inch cutter going the full quarter inch depth all the way through the material. The cutter is made by Lakeshore Carbide, and pretty much all my cutters are Lakeshore Carbide. 
I think have quality, they're U.S. made, they're quality stuff at a reasonable price. At least I assume they're U.S. made. I haven't seen the factory, but. Path looks a little bit all over the place, but hey, that's Bobcad. So now I'm going to be switching to a quarter inch three flute cutter for the finishing, and I'm doing that because the design requires, actually I'm not sure it requires, but yeah, it, it kind of does require now that I think about it, requires one fairly tight inside radius. And hey, the quarter inch tool does a fine job. And oh, what a nice surface finish. This machine makes beautiful parts. So I'm going to continue running the parts. I've got one more operation that probably isn't worth showing on camera, and that is to drill and tap on the bridge port a perpendicular hole on this end. This is the stop that prevents the head from over-rotating. And so there's a little set screw in here. I don't know if anybody's actually ever used it, but it's designed to allow adjustment so that you can adjust the head to be perpendicular if you're pressing a Maria or in some, doing some other kind of an operation where you want the head to be perpendicular to your surface there are set screws provided that uh, allow you to adjust that. Of course, the Inqualla isn't a machine tool, so it ain't going to be within a few thousandths, but it's, uh, if anybody ever uses it, it's probably close enough for glasswork. So that concludes today's video. Thank you for watching. As I continue to use this machine, it's getting more and more comfortable and more and more fun. And except for my complaints about the software, the user interface, the machine itself is magnificent. And uh, nothing but compliments and respect to the Haas machine designers. Now if they can just get their software act together, boy, if I was younger and they were hiring, I could fix it. But hey, now I'm doing this, so see you later.